This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and High Tech Oki. Plus, our brand new patrons. They didn't take the Memorial Day weekend off. We have Mark and Joseph. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Joseph, for your support. Coming up on DTNS, AI existential risk again gets the spotlight, the memification of education, and Computex is back in a big way. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 30th, 2023, from lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Trapolino. And coming to you from the DMV, your boy, Big Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Yeah, big thanks to Chris for stepping up. Will Smith was scheduled to be on today. We was having some technical issues. We will reschedule him, but we have the great Chris Ashley on. So let's get everything started with the quick hits. Amazon began testing dine-in payment options in its app with select restaurants in Bengaluru, India. Users have an option for paying with credit cards, bank accounts, UPI, and Amazon Pay Later in the app. India's dominant food delivery services, Zomato and Swiggy, both offer similar dine-in payment options, so Amazon catching up there. Ninantic is known for its popular AR phone apps, notably Pokemon Go, but its latest release shows it has plans for mixed reality as well. The developer announced a new web app called Wall. This can be played on a phone as an AR experience, but can also use the pass video feature on Meta's Quest 2 and Quest Pro VR headsets. The app presents a talking owl that interacts with the user with facts about a virtual redwood forest. Niantic director of product Tim Emmerich, or Tom Emmerich, excuse me, said it created the app to demonstrate its eighth wall development platform for building web-based AR apps. Apple released its Apple Music Classical app for Android after debuting the iOS app back in March. This release comes ahead of some other Apple-owned platforms, so putting priority on mobile. There's no Mac or iPad-optimized version of the app as of yet, and the iOS app isn't viewable with CarPlay. Sad note, Amazon disconnected, uh, discontinued its celebrity voices for its virtual assistant. Amazon launched the feature back in 2019 with the voice of Samuel L. Jackson and later adding Shaq and Melissa McCarthy. In addition to no longer being available for purchases, users who paid for them will lo also lose access. The Samuel Jackson voice is already gone, and while the other two voices are still available, they will also be discontinued September 30th. According to an updated support page spotted by Mark Gurman, eagle-eyed as always, Apple will shut down its My Photo Stream photo syncing service on July 26th, with users able to upload photos until June 26th. Now, if you say, I have no idea what this is, this was Apple's pre-iCloud photo syncing service that it launched back in 2011, which synced photos to Apple's cloud for a rolling 30 days, but store up to 1,000 photos on your disparate devices. Apple will point users to iCloud as a replacement. All right, so over the weekend, a story broke out about an attorney using chat GPT to do case research for an affidavit. Of course, uh, this was spotted because no one could find out any of the cases. And it turns out the chatbot made up some of the cases that were filed in court. The judge was uh, super happy about it, as you can imagine. That's an example of the here and now risk something like generative models can do. But we also recently got this statement crystallizing the concerns of AI's existential risk. This is, this is a direct quote of the statement here. Mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. That statement was signed by Google's former AI chief, Jeffrey Hinton, as well as CEOs of Google DeepMind, Anthropic, Stability AI, Inflection AI, and OpenAI, as well as dozens of other researchers. Oh, and uh, Grimes signed it too for reasons. This was published by the Not-for-Profit Center for AI Safety, or CAIS, you may see it in the press, which said it made the statement purposely concise to open up the discussion about AI's most severe risk. So Chris, I guess we'll take them up on this. Let's open up the discussion. I'm curious how you're looking at this statement. So anytime I see uh, a, a statement like this, I, I, you know, I have to get super cynical and yeah, it's it's unfortunate, but it's it's just the way it goes in in the nature of of, of today's world. Because when I look at this and I say, okay, you know, by any means, any new technology that is exploding onto the world should always be looked at from a perspective of you know what are we doing uh, 
as far as damaging uh, people and interactions and, you know, the universe itself. But at the same time, when you look at all of the people that kind of signed on to this thing, I, I would be hard pressed to say that any of them didn't bring a technology that some way damaged um, our society to some extent. So I, I'm like, it, again, it's a, one of those cases of right message, wrong messenger. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, in the end. But Chris, who would be, I guess, who would be the right messenger then? Like if this same message was delivered by who would it, would it sound better from, I guess? So I, I think uh, if the technology was brought about with the same, with this message in the beginning, like, Hey, we're bringing this out. Um, and, uh, but we have these caveats around making sure that we're not damaging. That would have been the point and the, and, and the appropriate mm -hmm. point and the, the, probably the best first people to make this statement, right? Because that is, that seem would be seem to be more honest, you know, but when you have companies that are literally fighting to make sure that they can take advantage of this very same technology that they're talking about. They want to find ways to put rules around. And traditionally they have been against uh, having additional rules put on their organizations and, uh, and uh, regulations put on top of them. So all of a sudden they're all for regulations. Now I don't, I don't buy that. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. just, to me, it's just like, I, you know, I, I have a hard time believing that these guys are coming from a, uh, a righteous place which is to me always my barometer as to how i feel about somebody's statement right is it righteous I mean, it's really interesting that two of them uh google deep mind anthropic and uh, open ai are active players currently in the in the ai development uh, uh space and i've always wondered you know one of the great things about regulations is that it kind of freezes things in place Right. And like oftentimes regulations are built around what's already available and you can use them as a way to kind of uh, uh, kind of set up the playing field. And if you're someone who's already dominant in that field, you can set it up in a way that kind of uh, ad uh, advantages your playbook as opposed to your competitors. Um, and for me, that would be the cynical take. Yeah, they of course, they want regulation because. They're kind of they're kind of at that point in the field where they are are so I don't want to say so far ahead, but they're definitely leading the pack. That as soon as you have the regulations in place, it keeps them where they are and maybe puts puts a, a, a drag on any up and comers. That's a great point because I actually had it from the opposite side, right? Because if you're behind, you also want regulations out there to slow down your competitors who are ahead of you. Right. So but that's a great point is to, you know, hey, let's keep the other folks behind, which also does happen. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's really important to, to stipulate, you know, we've we've already seen a lot of these companies, OpenAI, Microsoft uh, coming out and saying, you know, hey, we want to get ahead of regulation here. Uh, maybe not the way the EU is looking at it right now with their AI Act, but this very much sets the bar very high when it comes to like the very specific harms, societal scale risks is essentially, it feels like this is setting the the expectation of regulation at, right? As opposed to, we had a statement from uh, the, the director of uh, the uh, Center for, um, excuse me here, <laughs> I want to make sure I get the name of it right, uh, uh, the center that we, we were talking about here, Dan Hendricks, saying that things like systemic bias, misinformation, malicious use, cyber attacks, and weaponizations were examples of like the here and now dangers as opposed to existential risk that is down the road. It's yeah. very clear to say this isn't an either or thing. He said it, no, would, be reckless, sure. it would be yeah. reckless to ignore those, but it seems also very clear. Like the reason OpenAI it feels like is signing on to this is because they want to set the where they want to set the bar for regulation. And, yeah, and I, yeah. go ahead, oh, Roger. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just saying like you know because they're so they're they're so influential in this space. They could probably have a hand in writing some, or at least drafting some of that regulation, you know, with 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 what they think is beneficial. It's very interesting because it is very apocalyptic the way it's described, and part of it I think is a way to kind of get people to notice and then take action, but action that benefits all the players at the same time. It's it's kind of a weird, almost beneficial uh, system, and it's not that regulation is bad and in some cases it's, it's very good but right what what to what chris was saying i mean in a way you kind of want to follow the money and see who's who's 100%. really benefiting from it right 
And the fact that this organization they put together did not clearly put out there where their donations are coming from, Mm -hmm. that already puts me on edge, right? It's because, you know, most of the times you got to follow the money if you want to see where these things are coming from. And and the pro- and the problem why this is such a weird discussion is because we all agree, definitely pay attention to what AI is doing, where it could potentially damage us down the road, what type of things are going to happen. 100% we agree with that. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, at least anybody I think that would be looking at this and seeing what's going on. So that's what makes it such a weird discussion is like you got the right message, but mm, I don't know well, if I want to hear from you. And it's also notable that despite the fact that there is a huge list of AI researchers and that looks like, oh, every AI researcher is worried about this, it's important to note that we don't have any signees from Meta, Amazon, Apple, not on there. Not too surprising from Apple, but you know, Meta and Amazon, lots of AI research there as well. And also the uh, uh, one of the researchers that was awarded the Turing Award along with Jeffrey Hinton, Jan Leclun of uh, NYU, uh, also works at Meta, came out and, and said, the most common reaction by AI researchers to these prophecies of doom is face palming. So this is not like a consensus reaction right. among AI researchers either. Important context. Yep. Well, uh, another important thing besides the fate of AI on human existence is uh, memes. If you look at any online space for a community, chances are high that you'll run into memes. This is especially true for things like subreddits and Discord servers, because mostly everyone on them understands the original message that's often lampooned in uh, one of these image macro memes. Now, TechCrunch's Amanda Sieberling has highlighted a new ed tech startup called Antimatter that's trying to turn this on its head. What if educators used memes to help ensure students understand what they're learning? Antimatter provides iOS and web-based meme-making tools, and teachers get recommendations about how to use these tools with students. Antimatter is also working on enterprise tools and eventually hopes to build a larger puzzle-based learning platform. All right, Chris, is this something, sounds something like that might actually engage students or is it just going to give them a shrug where it's another kind of quote, how do you do fellow kids moment uh, from uh, 30 rock? So I find that to be a fascinating, great question because in my opinion, it doesn't matter if it either or right, because at the end of the day, all my favorite teachers that I learned the most from always was able to communicate with me at the at a level that I was operating at, right? So, you know, they could use a vernacular that I was familiar with, or they could make a joke about something, or they could talk about something um, in a TV show, or, and, and it just helped me, it helped resonate with uh, what I was trying to learn. So by the same um, manner, I believe that the kids that are looking at this, even if they find the teacher to be goofy or the meeting to be goofy, they'll remember it because it's goofy. You know what I mean? And if they find it to be funny or really actually really good, they'll remember it because it's funny and really good. So I I think it doesn't matter. I love that they're doing this. It kind of reminds me. So depending on when you went to to junior high or or grade school, uh, you might remember a game called Oregon Trail. Or if you're from my generation, you remember the game Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. And all these were games that were designed to uh, with a focus on education. Where in the world Carmen San Diego? Where in the USA? This Carmen San Diego is focused around geography, knowing places, their relation to each other, and what they're they're known for culturally. Uh, Oregon Trail, supply, figure your you know your your troop of people don't die from dysentery or whatever, and you made it. It was a good game, and I'm wondering if this is one of those things where we're they're finding the most appropriate tools to kind of talk to to kids in a way that's engaging. I mean, I do see a danger here because it really depends on the the person using it. If you do it right, it can be like a game where people, the kids really get engaged and learn something, or it can be really bad, like in the late 80s and early 90s, where everyone was making a rap video about stranger danger, (laughs) what to eat, you know, things about health. And they were very cynically done without really understanding what hip hop was about. And so you had really bad, cringy music that just turned off people and in many ways became memes themselves uh now that if you you know surf the internet 
except for don't copy that floppy certified <laughs> banger yes but the, the difference between those those rap videos though are those were like so top down right it was like an yes. adult interpreting like a like a culture that was not theirs to speak to it generally i, I i'm sure some of them may have came from a place of uh you know uh, being informed about that kind of stuff but uh, the vast majority of them, the reason they're memes is because it's someone completely out of touch with that trying to make it what's exciting to me about this animator stuff is actually some of like the lesson plan details you get and it, it kind of shows that like they they understand like they have talked to kids, right? Because it's not just, hey, here's a blank meme, fill this in with details about World War One. That's like one example of they showed like, hey, you can you can use it like this. But the more exciting one to me is they have, all right, here is a subject that we've just recently studied. Half the kids, you make any meme about this, all right? Or maybe from a select set, make a meme about this. And then another kid is going to try and figure out what this meme was about. So if like you're in right. a calculus class about a calculus concept or something like that. And so it, it, it shows that's like, this has to be kid or like, or like youth conversant, right? It can't just be, oh, lame adult is coming up with this. It like, it has to speak within that generation for it to work. Uh, and, and I think that's like su a super smart approach to doing that, right? As opposed to just rote stuff. Right. And I think the the thing that I love the most about this is that uh Libov, uh, who's uh, you know, in charge of this, um, he jokes about turning a kid from a C to a C plus student, which, you know, on the face of it, you're like, Come on, you 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 want a C student to be an A student. But his point is I, I'm not trying to give these guys, you know, all this additional work where it becomes a chore to do this. I it, you know, I want these guys to have fun and get excited about learning and if they get better grades along the way so be it you know just an added bonus so i love the approach that he's taking uh with this instead of just assuming that this is the problem and i have the solution for it you know it's literally let's let's let the kids use what they do every day anyway to find better ways for them to learn right and i think that's the mistake we make a lot is we all think we have the answer and then we just say just do it like this and then you know it's not beneficial to the kid but if you allow the child to do something like this that's in their own uh realm then now they're going to find the best ways to learn for themselves well if you have thoughts about memes in education or anything else that we've talked about this show uh you don't know our email address i I don't know if you've ignored it all these times, but here it is, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Send us an email. Let us know your thoughts. All right. Well, we've just seen the first in-person Computex in three years. Yes, it's back. And I don't I don't know about you guys, but it seems like it was like a big deal this year. Like usually Computex, I don't know, it's just a couple of posts. It's kind of like a, a techie, like insider, very, very back end kind of show. Lots of interesting announcements on this. So I wanted to run down some of them. I think first off, we have to acknowledge like NVIDIA kind of led the show with a lot of killer announcements. The one that was getting a lot of steam was the NVIDIA DGX GH200. And this is basically like their platform for a generative AI supercomputer. It uses like it, the, the specs on this are crazy. It uses 256 of these uh, uh, Grace Hopper uh, uh, like SOCs basically to form a single GPU, 144 terabytes of shared memory. And they're claiming one exaflop of performance. We're going to see Google meta and microsoft as customers of these and uh, nvidia is going to be making their own supercomputer based on that as well we're also seeing an nvidia mediatek partnership on car infotainment basically mediatek is going to be using nvidia chips and software and it's going to integrate into nvidia self-driving tech uh, and then we also had kind of a, a corollary to this you know we saw nvidia top a one trillion dollar market cap just the stock price went up because they had a bunch of exciting announcements but that's kind of rarefied air for that company so Chris, is there like out of these, like, like what, what's speaking to you from, uh, from what you saw from NVIDIA? Well, there's a couple of things that uh, really caught me uh, about this and how it kind of led off everything. And one was, you know, we've been talking AI for what, six months now, seven months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've mostly been talking about a software and we've been talking about it from a uh, societal impact, but it didn't even dawn on me that, you know, the hardware side of it where and all these hardware guys jumped right in the game and was like, yeah, yeah, we're going to provide, you know, virtualization in our platforms to make sure that the, you know, these desktops and laptops can take advantage of AI much more efficiently. And it's just it just blew my mind. So it made me start to wonder, it's like, where else is AI going to play 
um, and, you know, have an impact where we just didn't even think of it yet. So this, this, that's the first thing that caught me. The second thing was the uh, infotainment system in the cars. You know, I was one of those guys that had the ridiculous stereo system <laughs> in the car. And I miss uh, being able to have you know, the, the third party stereo installed and have these crazy subwoofers in the back and all this stuff. I mean, you can still do it, but, you know, you're not taking out your infotainment system. And <laughs> and so when you saw that, uh, you know, that uh, I think was uh, for, uh, not, was a Ford or Chevy. One of them was removing uh, Apple. Uh, I CarPlay. believe it was Ford. I believe it was. Oh no, it was Chevy. It was GM. It was GM. Yeah, Excuse it was me. moving CarPlay, which I thought was like that. Kind of caught caught everybody off guard. I was like, why would you do that? <laughs> um, you know, I thought that the uh, car manufacturer getting into you know customizing the infotainment system was was the, going the way of the dodo. But it seems like now that Nvidia's you know, creating chips for these systems, it seems like it, this might be coming roaring back with, uh, um, you know, individual car manufacturers, you know, developing their own infotainment systems. And I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. My, my guess is I'm not going to enjoy it as much because I actually one of those people that really do enjoy CarPlay. Um, but those mm. are the two things that kind of caught my eye out of this uh, initial uh, launch. Roger, has anything stood out to you? So one of these, the big one, of course, is Grace Hopper. I mean, it's if you've seen it, and I've seen videos of, of the actual unit, it's huge, it's heavy, but it's incredibly like fast. It, 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 well, what's interesting is they're pairing an ARM design uh, with their GPU to, to create this super, on a very fast custom-made interconnect, and they put them side by side so they're, they're, there's enough throughput. Um, I think it's 96 gigs or mm -hmm. more. Uh, pretty, I mean, it's crazy fast. And it, they they did mention they did all their comparisons vis-a-vis -vis their GPUs with an x86 platform. They were saying how much more power efficient per watt, how much more performance you got per watt using the Grace Hopper setup with an ARM CPU and and their GPU. And it's really telling that they kind of see x86 as kind of a legacy device in this in in this space because unlike other server workloads where you use x86 because you have a lot of old software that you need backward compatibility with with a lot of these ai systems a lot of these companies are just writing everything from scratch so there's no backward compatibility to worry about so you want to go with the most efficient mm. power efficient uh devices that you can it also speaks to me with the nvidia one trillion dollar market cap is that this is where nvidia has always wanted to be it's where it's planned to be <laughs> gpus for gaming gpus for for the consumer set was the stepping stone to get there and I'm wondering in a way because of the the kind of rather lukewarm uh, uh, reception to the latest 4060 uh, Ti uh, mid-range GPU that NVIDIA put out, um, if that was just a case of NVIDIA focusing so highly on the AI portion of their business that everything else is just kind of back burner stuff uh, for the foreseeable future because, I mean... This trillion dollar cap didn't come from hey we're gonna we're gonna power the next mm -hmm. you know doom we're gonna power the next you know fps we're powering ai and that's that's where the money is uh right. you know right now the other thing just to keep an eye on nvidia and MediaTek consolidation in this infotainment market right you have qualcomm intel and nvidia MediaTek. that is not a huge business for nvidia yet so they're partnering there one of the few areas i think where they they don't want to get edged out for sure some of the other stuff coming out of computex we have new arm gpu and cpu cores big news here is that these are all going 64 bit like for their ip package of the current gen stuff moving away from a 32-bit legacy support uh and they're providing modest like 15 percent improvement and performance performance for what across both of their flagships on there as well we also have uh, intel showing off their vision processing units for their meteor lake stuff so kind of low-end background ai processing and then the last one i wanted to get your guys feel for it was the asus gpu power slot so basically like if you plug in a gpu now you have to wire in all these heavy cables if it's a high-end one there's a slot in the motherboard and there's a slot in the card to power the card roger what are you the most excited for there um <sighs> This is the thing with the Asus GPU power slot. It sounds like a great idea, but it's very, it, right now it's just one company that's publicly pushing for it. 
Um, this reminds me a bit back in the 90s when IBM pushed their microchannel architecture because they got tired that they weren't getting royalties for the ISA bus, the the six, the 16-bit and the 8-bit, you know, the expansion slot on the back. And all the other PC companies got together, Dell, Tandy, and a few others, Compaq, and said, well, no, we're going to create our own standard. And it became the EISA, the Enhanced Industry Standard Slot. Anyways, all that became nothing because <laughs> Intel came up with PCI, didn't charge anyone anything or a small royalty fee for it. And that's became became the standard that replaced everything. And it sounds great. I mean, GPUs use a lot of juice and case like my my latest GPU, it's a 3060 Ti, takes 200 watts to run a video card. It's like crazy. And this is a nice, clean way to do it, but they would have to get everyone on board, and that means Gigabyte, uh, mm-hmm. as ASRock, and all the other board makers, as well as Intel and the ATX, you know, manufacturing board. So every one puts the slot at the same spot, spot, uh, and the ARM GPU CPU cores. This this is kind of what I was expecting. Moving over to sixty four bit, it's probably going to break some OSs and some applications. But the great thing about ARM is it's not that hard to recompile for uh, for sixty four bit registers. So I always find it amazing that these companies still try and, you know, try to corner some type of technology. Like, have you not learned from the past and seen that this never goes well? But unless you open it up for everybody and just get everybody on board, what are you doing? So we'll see. Hopefully, you know, they, you know, I'm not a hater. So if they make it happen, good for them. But uh, at the same time, it's like, come on, if you, you're coming out with this, you're telling everybody how great it is. But if you don't have everybody else on board, what what are we doing here? So that I always laugh at when I see that those type awesome. of oh we got this the, new proprietary. The, the, the one thing I'll say though is we just saw a bit a little bit of a controversy with uh, poorly seated power cables causing issues with uh, high end very expensive GPUs. All of a sudden, Async come out there even if it's not completely open and say you don't have to worry about that. It just clips in the bottom when you plug in your PCI connector. Everything's all good. That comes saying, that's, a pretty, that's a decent sales pitch. That's all I'm yeah, saying. It definitely is a decent sales pitch, but it comes with a price tag. And, you know, yeah, you know, true. folks nowadays are going to be like, mm. yeah, I can do that cheaper. So <laughs> I'm not um, with it. I know how to so. plug in a cable over here. <laughs> <laughs> also, Skelly, Skelly uh, 2909 makes a good point. You have to run up to, what, 600 or 500 watts through the motherboard? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's the other thing. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's some... You're gonna need some power regulation on that uh, for sure. That that is an impressive claim. I didn't even think about that. Really great point. We also had some great points uh, in our mailbag. Uh, Roger, what have we got in there today? Yep. Adam wrote in to thank us about uh, for the show and let us know he's been a patron for a few years. But he asks us a question. He wants to know: Do we know, or do we happen to know who? Uh, who he can uh, contact regarding installing an EV charging station for commercial use. He lives in a small northwest Kansas town, but it happens to be at the intersection of two fairly busy highways. He's considering trying to install a few commercial chargers on a piece of property near that intersection with a plan to expand to more chargers uh, later. However, there's no one local that he knows of that has any experience or understanding about how to do this and he's turning to us for help uh so out there when i mean out there our audience uh anyone have any advice and if you do please send it over to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com well let me just say that uh you know having gone through three months of getting my charger installed um my suggestion i have no idea um, about a commercial one but honest i would first find out who's the city council uh, where is the city council that governs that area and start with them? Because here at my house, when I try to get it, I had to go through the homeowners because they govern the area. And so uh, I, I would start with maybe locating who the councilman is for the area if if one exists and, and start there and, and work your way through that. Yeah, I, I'm excited to hear if, uh, if we get some great feedback and uh, Adam, uh, where you take this, because that sounds uh, kind of cool. All right. Well, thanks also to Chris Ashley for being on today's show. Bring in the fire, as always, the fantastic takes uh, all of the smoky goodness. Chris, where can people find more of your great stuff if they want to follow you on the cyberspace? Uh, you can definitely if you look, if you're hungry, come check me out on Barbecue and Tech. But uh, if you want to you know, sit down and chill with me and the boys, come, come uh, holler at us at SMR Podcast, me and the homies talking tech every week with a slightly different perspective than you hear. There's a reason why we're your favorite podcast, favorite podcast. 
<laughs> All right. Well, patrons, stick around for our extended show. Good day, Internet. We're going to be talking about the Arc Browser's new feature that lets you theme websites. And I'm, I'm a little excited about it. Remember, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about one of NVIDIA's other announcements at Computex about uh, integrating natural language into video games with Scott Johnson. Can't wait for it. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>